much for joining us for this public lecture. Yes. So we are very happy to welcome Dr. Bellinghausen to uh, talk to us about emotional intelligence. So um, Dr. Bellinghausen has been working and coaching and teaching emotional intelligence for the past 10 years, if not more. And she supports companies in the area of psychosocial risk management, emotional skill development, and well-being. Uh, along with her colleague from Young Young Business School, they have developed a new model as well as a tool to assess ability wise emotional intelligence. So she's going to talk to us about both the model, the concept, and also areas of development and improvement. Thank you very much for joining us. Emotion 
play a central role in decision making. A uh, long time people thought that decision making is a reasoning process. And uh, today, neuroscientific researchers show that you can't take decision without emotion. So there are emotions that will facilitate decision making, or others that can make decision making quite risky. So what everybody agrees today is that emotion play a quite important role. And so it is important we have to develop emotional intelligence to deal with it, so that the emotion get allies and not parasites. So, some results. Um, there are studies focusing on emotional intelligence, emotions, and decision making. Two kinds of study. There's one kind of study, they look at specific emotions and how they intervene in decision making process. We have uh, studies on joy, for example. And so, joy, first you can say, okay, joy helps us to be more intuitive, perhaps even to be creative. But the problem is when you are taking a decision, when you are enjoying, is that you take high risks and that you have trouble to concentrate. So joy can affect negatively your decision-making process. On the other hand, you have fear. Fear, if it is moderated, because if fear is too high, too intense, you will not take a decision. You are like paralyzed, you know? But if fear is moderated, it helps to take a decision because it will help you to concentrate and to focus and also you will take more moderated risks. So fear can help you to take decisions and be careful if you are in joy when you take decisions. It makes you overtake important risks. Another kind of study is looking more on emotional competences and the link to uh, decision making. Here you have a focus on emotional understanding of emotional logics. What is it? Emotions evolve in time. If you have a little joy, you know, a little joy can go and get more and more intense. We call it your understanding emotional logic. So first we have something like serenity, then joy, and perhaps after it gets to extase or something like that, you know? And what we observe is if you are a manager who understands these logics, what, what are you doing? You will take better decisions. Decisions who are more profitable for the organization you work. So it's interesting, here you see a really important link between emotional ability and decision making. Another part of studies is interested in leadership and emotional intelligence and they focus on what we call empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand and to welcome what other, what other people feel. And uh, we, the studies, they look how it works with leadership. And what they see, if you take a group of just people where no leader is, they look who will be the leader that emerges in the group. And what they observe is that this is the person who has the highest empathy rates. So it is a really important uh, um, dimension of leadership to be empathic because if you welcome and understand the feelings of the people, they feel better in the team. So it's like a natural quality of leadership. As a study, they look at more precise abilities of emotional intelligence. And what we see is when we have a leader who knows how to manage his emotions. So he knows, for example, I have a quite intensive emotion, but before expressing it, I will decrease the intensity, or perhaps I will modify my feeling. So that's about emotional regulation, okay? If the leader is able to do this, what we observe is that he has higher performance in his team, that he has higher social relations, better quality of social relations, and also he feels better, because emotional intelligence and the ability to manage emotion is highly implied in what we call well-being. A last study before working on emotion. A last study is interested about emotion and vision. And there are leaders, you know, they, they tell you something, they share their vision, and you just want to follow them. Okay? And you have leaders, they tell about their vision and, and you don't want to follow them. Okay, so these leaders who, who you want really to follow, what is the particular thing they put in their vision? When they talk about their vision, they put the emotions in, and that makes the difference. I take two photos, and I think each of you remembered the talk of the 
leaders here. Do you remember the talk when Obama cried? Oh, great question. Yes, you remember. What was it? It was the talk. There was a shooting, yeah? The shooting in the school, yes. And everyone remembers, you ask this question, people don't know a lot of talk of Obama, you know? But this talk, we remember because, yeah, he, he talked to us about the vision of guns in the country, and he cried in front of the cameras. And that was really impact, okay? After, okay, we can discuss, was it tactic, strategic use of uh, tears, or was it uh, authentic, whatever. We remember this talk. So what you see is when you put emotion in your vision, and I coach CEOs on this, how you make a speech and you put emotions in the speech to clarify the message you want to share. So here also we see emotion as a really advantage in leadership, in management at the workplace. So, what all this suggests is that our time, emotion, emotional intelligence is a really core ability for manager. And it's more important sometimes at, uh, than technical uh, skills, because technical skills you, you have your team for it. But if you don't know how really to employ, employ each member of your team, uh, you will not be a really effective manager. So all this to tell you what? To tell you that there are at least four reasons to develop your emotional intelligence. Your emotional intelligence or your emotional intelligence in organization and workplace. We already talked about, first thing, it's about performance. If you align the right emotional state at the right moment, you will be better in performance, creativity, negotiation, group performance. We have a lot of studies showing that emotion is performance. After we have studies about quality in relationship, perhaps you know sometimes people they never express first any emotion. And what's the problem with these people is you don't know if they like what you say or if they don't like. And so it's quite uh, difficult sometimes to get close in a relationship. Because if you tell someone I like how we work together, I feel joy or pride, it's to say okay we are in the good way working together. And if you never say that you are irritated or a bit angry, yeah, you don't know how to work better together and what you have to change. So what we observe is when you express emotion in relationship, you get higher quality in your relationship. After we have two major results left to comment, first of all, emotion also intervene in health. What we observe is, for example, that uh, if you have um, good emotional intelligence, you have less depression problems, less problems with burnout, three times less burnout. It's, it's huge. Also, you have less back pain, stomach pain. There's a really, really goal, manage your emotion to enhance your health. And at the least, we have well-being. People who know to manage their emotions they have increased well-being. Why? Because, for example, imagine a day, you start your day with anger, after you have a moment of fear, after you have a moment of disgust. Imagine if you have a day where you only live unpleasant emotions. Well-being seems quite far away. And since emotional intelligent people, they have something like a balance, the inner balance of unpleasant and pleasant emotion. For one unpleasant emotion, Emotional intelligent people, they experience three to five pleasant emotions. So they have a really interesting ratio that is favorite for well-being. As an example also what we see is that pleasant emotion enhance and strengthen your immune system. So you are not as often ill, uh, you have better resistance. So there are at least four reasons why it is important to develop emotional intelligence for you in an organization. 
So we already talked a lot about emotion, emotional intelligence, but we don't define what is emotional intelligence, what do emotional intelligent people do. So what we observe is that folks, they welcome the full range of emotion. You know, they don't have like taboo emotion. Uh, they really welcome every emotion. It can be anger, sadness, fear, contempt, but also joy, pride, interest. They really welcome a large, large panel of emotions. That's the first thing. And then, what are they doing with this? Yeah, they will analyze these emotions. They try to differentiate between emotions. They will try to understand which are the triggers of these emotions. And once they have understood this emotion, then they will make a place for strategic emotion management and use emotion in the given situation. So if you are really expert everywhere, okay, it's like uh, in France, we mentioned you have just one person of the population who are really high, high experts in everything of this. Usually, we have all our preferred emotions, some emotions we are really not uh, like or we have difficult to manage, but you see, it is possible. What is nice and really interesting with emotional intelligence is that you can develop it all over your life. It's not because today you are perhaps not an expert, that tomorrow you can't be an expert. It depends on your, your ability to manage yourself, to train yourself, and to have also the knowledge to develop it. And that's what we try to see now. So, what is emotion? If I have to, uh, to define emotion, I would say that emotions are guides. You know, emotions, they help us to adapt to environment. They will tell us how we are in relation with the environment. Is the environment uh, secure? Is the environment perhaps a uh, danger? And they will tell us, okay, if it's secure, I can do this or that. And it's not the same thing if it's unsecure. So emotion helps us to be in relation with our environment and to adapt to our environment successfully. That it is about. A long time emotion were opposed to reasoning. And what is interesting with emotional intelligence, it uh, helps to combine both. Because emotional intelligence is the ability to reason on emotions. So we need both, in fact, in emotional intelligence. Alors, excuse me, it was French. <laughs> so, what is guide? Is we do emotions are guides, okay? So, uh, why do we call them guides? Because they have four major roots. What are they? First of all, emotions are messages. So, when you feel an emotion or you see an emotion in someone, what is the first thing to do is to ask you what is the message of this emotion? We already talked about fear. The message of fear is clearly there is somewhere danger. What is the message of anger? Anger, the message is perhaps there is somewhere a problem with justice, there is injustice or non respect of, of values. So that's when you are angry, there's something about that. If you are quiet, what it is? The message of pride is yeah, high self esteem. <coughs> So each emotion has this specific emo message to adapt in our environment. Next point is that emotions have specific roots. So what are the roots? For example, for fear, fear will help us to secure, to develop behaviors that help us to protect ourselves or our people. Also fear will help us to think out of the box. Because if you have fear, you can't take the first solution as the good solution, because perhaps it is not the good solution. So fear will help us to find the best solution and help us thinking out of the box. That's why fear stimulates creativity. So that's the rule of fear. The rule of anger is not the same, it's another rule. And what does anger help us to do? It helps us to change things. If you are angry about something, you want something to change. It was not ju justice, what happened? So you want justice. 
your value was offended, yet you want such a value will be respected. So anger always comes with the need of change. So that was the second point. After the third point is that emotion always support behavior, action. Emotion have action tendency. The word emotion comes from emovere, what is movement. So each emotion makes us move. Even if, for example, sadness, it's like you don't move, but it's, it still is behavior, you know? So what are the moves? We talked about fear. What, what, have, what do you want to do when you are frightened? Yeah, normally you want to take your legs at your... I a votre coup. Yeah, you want to run away. That's like fear behavior. If you're not angry, you don't want to run away. What are you doing when you are angry? You will attack, you will defend your point of view. That are the behaviors of anger. And if you are, for example, proud, you want to share, you want to celebrate. So each emotion has his own behavioral manifestation. Okay. Last point, emotion facilitate decision making. I already talked about this one. But what is here also important is before you take a decision, make like an emotional weather report. Are your emotions in line with the decision or perhaps not? So here you have emotion has good intentions. When we feel an emotion, it's not to, to uh, there is an adaptive value. Emotions have good intention for us. But is it always? the case. Sometimes perhaps if anger is too intensive and I express it to my colleague or my friend, but perhaps I'm, I use words I can regret after it. Or perhaps sometimes fear blocks me. I want to do study, or, I don't know, study in another, another country, but I'm afraid to leave my country, to go to another country, and so I don't go. Here perhaps the emotion is not adaptive because it, it do not allow you to go the way you want. So sometimes emotions are not our guides. Emotions sometimes can be parasites. And in this moment, what do we need? It's emotional intelligence. So what is it? What is it about? I have a little film for you to show you what emotional intelligence is about. So here you will just have like uh, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, a little film, and you will assist to an emotional intelligent behavior. So I invite you just to try to have a look and to identify uh, the emotional behavior, intelligent behavior in this little film. Sometimes when you are in the plant plant. So that must be Did you see the, the, the was an emotional intelligent behavior of a player? Can you tell me which behavior, which emotion? Maybe you were like angry with someone or played me after like a walking there to punch him or something. And he sees the opportunity and ran all the way to the to touch down. What did I kind of get? Yeah, it was on this exactly. Uh, just like calm because that is something.
situated in the address uh, team. <coughs> what? Yeah, confused. It was surprise, surprise. And surprise at a high intensity, what does it do? People are paralyzed. And that's really the, the negative consequence of surprise when it gets really intense. And here for him, it is not a negative consequence, it's like an advantage. And to use this emotion, he has to know exactly what you told us. He has to know that this behavior is against every, every, um, intention. Yeah, normally it's like you say a little bit aggressive. Everybody uh, goes on the others. Yeah, and you know he, he just slowly walk, and it's against every expectation, and that is the trigger of surprise. So here you see it is an emotional intelligent behavior in sport setting, but we can have the same in organization. We, have, we can have the same in daily life. If you know that fear helps decision-making process or stimulates creativity. Yeah, when you have to do creativity tasks, you can invite fear to help you. So that's emotional intelligence about. It's managing emotions you feel spontaneously, but it's also sometimes to invite special emotions to come to help you in different tasks you have to manage. So, it was to introduce emotional intelligence, but more precisely, what it is about. Emotional intelligence is how you can align with your emotion and the context you are. If you have a goal, a goal like creating relationship, which is the emotion that can help you here by doing this? And so after you align with this emotion and it will enhance your performance and your well-being. We have two. Oh, I lost my mic. Hello? So, emotional intelligence, when we talk about, and you, you find it for, for all the research, researchers, everybody is okay for that. You have two big areas. The first area is about how you can diagnose emotion, how you can identify, differentiate emotion in yourself but also in others. And then the second part is a more tactic, strategy part. It's about how you can use the emotion you identified to enhance performance and well-being in yourself, in others and in teams. So that's emotional intelligence. We have two big areas diagnose or check up, and on the other hand, it's strategic use. When we look deeper in this, what can we discover? We discover seven core abilities, and I will propose to you now to zoom in each one of these abilities. To diagnose your emotions, you first can look at your body symptoms. What is my body telling me? Is there a, uh, a change? And another entry would be emotional cues like expression, behavior. And the third cue is the triggers of emotion. Each emotion has its own trigger. So this is also an interesting information to really know which emotion you feel or another person feel. So let's look in each one of them. Body symptoms, what it is about. Body symptoms. We have the first part, it's about rhythm. You have emotions that will increase rhythm in your body. Heart rate, respiration, this is increased. Other emotions will slow all this down. You have another information, it's about tension in your muscles. There are emotions that will give tension in you, and others that it's uh, like calm or lack of tension, or under tension, okay? It's not enough tension. Another information is where it is. Is it in your belly, in your head, in your food, or in the whole body? It's like locating the emotion. And sometimes I have people in coaching that say, oh, I know where emotion is in the body. It's just here in my chest. And it's when I feel pain. I say, oh, wow. You, you start to feel emotion when you have pain, 
and it's just in your chest. So we are working to acknowledge all these different cues to know where your emotion is. And what is important is that really when the emotion is little, that you can feel it in your body. There's just a little acceleration, but your heart is not coming out of the chest. So I propose you a little exercise on it, okay? Here you have different bodies. The, it's a study and people are interested in, okay, you have here activation or underactivation. Here, the blue body is when you don't feel an emotion, it's neutral, okay? And if you go in the red and the yellow, it's really activated your body. Your heart rate is activated, respiration, and tension in muscles, okay? It's really activation. And on the other hand, if you go down in the blue, it's less and less and less activated. It's not like a, like a calm or relaxing, okay? It's really your body is underactivated, okay? So here you have four bodies. Your task is to tell me which body is which emotion. So body number one, is it anger, happiness, sadness or fear? You have the four emotions up there, so connect them just to the body. to know it, to manage it. 
We talked about a first emotional intelligence cue. We are, we are treated apart. Why? Because it's really implicated in burnout. A lot of people believe they have low, low conscious of body impact on emotion. They, they often experience difficulties with chronic fatigue, burnout, and such symptoms because they don't feel, they are not aware how it's affected by it. So that's why we developed a, a really independent competencies of it. And then you have the other emotional cues. What is it? First, you have facial expression, posture, gest, voice even, that say, okay, which emotion perhaps the other person feel or I feel. And I do a lot of coaching, for example, with a telephone or Skype. And sometimes on telephone, I, I don't have the, the face of the person. But I can feel what she feels because of voice information. So a lot of emotion also passes my voice. So that is one cue. After we already talked about behavior and action tendencies, each emotion has its own pattern. So it's interesting here also to know these patterns. After you have cognitive, cognitive uprising, it's what you think about the situation you are in. And this cognitive uprising, it's like your inner voice. And this inner voice helps you also to know which emotion you feel or which emotion another person feels. For example, in organizations, sometimes people, they say, oh, I, I really don't understand. I, I'm lost. I, I have, where are the priorities? I don't know anymore. And all of this, is about fear, about loss of control and uncertainty. And if people they talk about this or if you think in these terms, what does it say? It says that you are in cognitive uprising elements about fear. So what we say to us or what we hear by others helps us also to know to which emotion we have to deal with. The last component of emotion is feeling. What is feeling? It's really the subject, it's your personal way to experience an emotion. I, I had one person I worked with and, and what, what the, she said to me it was, she had envy. Do you know envy? Okay. And what she, she said to me, it's like, envy is like, I'm burning from my head to my foot. I said, oh, wow, okay. So it was quite difficult to connect this person to the positive outcome of envy. You imagine, because for her it was just like burning. Okay. And so this feeling part, it's really what makes the difference between people. Because another person can say, oh, you know, envy, it's for me like stimulation. Because I will try to get better and have what the other person has. And it's a completely different experience of this emotion. So sometimes if we talk with a person about emotion, we will not really understand what she says because she talks in his personal language. I had another person once I was coaching and she said, I oh, you know, each time I go to my organization, I have butterfly in my belly. I said, okay, butterfly in my belly. In my culture, is it like you feel love? I don't know what is in your culture. Yeah, in, in Germany, in France, it's, it's right about love. But she seemed not really in love with her organization, so it must, it must be something else. And for her, it was fear. And so when you are in interaction with people, always stay in mind that perhaps the way the person expressed is not the same way as you will describe your emotional experience. So you will say, okay, but so it's quite difficult to know what another person feels. Yeah, it is quite difficult. And what helps? is that you at least consider three cues, not one. Often it is one cue who tells us there is an emotion. And then, I don't know if you know Sherlock Holmes, but he is there and he tries to find other cues. And emotional, uh, to know what emotion you have to deal with, it's like in Sherlock Holmes. Look for other cues. You need three other cues to be nearly certain which emotion you have to deal with. So we talk first about the body symptoms, here you have other cues, and there is another element about uh, how you can identify emotion. It's about the triggers of emotion. What we know is that each emotion has its own trigger. 
So fear has not the same trigger as anger, pride has another trigger than joy. And what is interesting is to know these triggers. Why know these triggers? Because when you know them, yeah, you can choose a little bit your emotional future. Because when you know what makes you happy, you can place the happy trigger on your day, on your, on your day. In the morning you can say, when I wake up, I have to meet my trigger for joy. So if you know your triggers, you can choose your emotional future. In organization, it is really important for managers. Managers, when they deliver a message, they have to imagine what will be the emotional reaction of the team. Will it be more like fear, anger, joy? And he has to imagine it to know a little bit how to manage it. So that it is about. So when you have an emotion, ask you what is the trigger. We have two big categories of trigger. First is external. Okay, the external one it can be the physical environment. You know, here we are in a really nice place. It's perhaps not the same if uh, you you have to do conference. Uh, in a cave, you know? It's not the same also if you have physical environment, if you live here, or if you live in France, or you live in Afghanistan, or whatever. We have environment, physical environment will affect our emotional state. Also, it's about social environment. If I meet someone, the other person can be a trigger of emotion. Our studies show that often, other people are the biggest trigger of unpleasant emotion, but also of pleasant emotion. And there is another, a last external trigger in the emotion of other people. If someone feels an emotion, I will feel it too. We have, uh, we are, from a neurological point, we are programmed to feel what other people feel. We call it the uh, neuro miroir, mirror yeah. And so here, what studies show, for example, if you had a meeting and it was a really stressful meeting, okay, and the people go out of the room, and after there were new people coming in the room, what do we observe? We observe that these people get stressed. Why? Because in the air of this room there were hormones about stress, and so it stress people. Okay, so the emotion of others affect us. So we have to decide and know how to manage them. So if someone feels perhaps joy, it's not the same problem as we are affected by fear or, or by anger from another person. So that is about external triggers. Then we have internal triggers. I will not talk about all internal triggers, it, it would take a, a, a lot of time. But this morning, trigger really interesting. Interesting, why? Because it uh, helps us how to manage emotion. And what it is? It is needs. What are needs? Needs are really our, what we need. Uh, it's about uh, uh, recognition, be love, change, also to belong to. There are fundamental needs. And emotion tell us, for example, if needs are satisfied or not. Unpleasant emotions said that our needs are unsatisfied. If they are satisfied, we will more have like pleasant emotions. But we can be more precisely. We talk already about anger. Anger, uh, we have often a problem with justice, offense, or something about values. That is our trigger. What is the need? Anger, it's the need of change. So if you feel anger in a situation you can't change anything, it's not the right emotion because anger gives you the energy to change. And it only will calm down if you change the thing you have to change. So that's about needs. Another example, the, the fear. Fear is about danger. So the need will be protection and safety. What about a pleasant emotion? Take um, joy. What is the trigger? Often it's about happiness.
having an event uh, that is uh, helping us to develop or, or something about accomplishment. What is the need? Often the need is to share with other people, to be with other people. That is the need who is satisfied when you feel joy. Okay? So, I will ask you, I have an emotion, which trigger and which is the need? And it really, it is about emotional regulation. There is a part of emotional regulation. It's about how you can satisfy your fundamental needs. So that is what I want to share with you about emotional triggers. So there's just, a, before passing on the strategy use, just one point. We talked about trigger, but sometimes you can be in the same situation and at the end, you have different emotions, okay? For example, um, I like to work with people who had like burnout or traumatic uh, life events, you know? And for me, it's like quite interesting and exciting. But I can, I, I have colleagues who, when, when they are in front of a person who suffers, they're not excited, you know, they, they are much more like afraid. So how can you explain that two people in the same situation experience different emotions? It's a question of how you will interpret, how you will, uh, what is your cognitive upright of the situation? For me, it's how can I help the person? Uh, which tools can I bring up so that, she, that the person will, will get back to well-being? And my colleague perhaps will more think about I don't have the resources to help the person, I don't have tools. So it's about how we interpret the situation, and that's the real trigger. The real trigger is what is the, is the situation I have resources to manage with? Is it with my goal? Is it supportive or not? And all of these evaluations, they are the real trigger of emotion, and it defines the nature of emotion, pleasant or unpleasant. And it also defines the intensity of emotion. If there is a really a, a lot of importance in the situation, like my life is in, 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 in the situation, yeah, you will have really intense emotion. If it's not really important for you in the situation, you will not feel a big emotion, or even perhaps not any emotion in the situation. So it's how we see the situation that will rise the emotion. So this part is 50% in the emotions we live in a day. Our, our emotional life is 50% of how we perceive our environment. So if you want to change your emotional climate, if you want to live more joy, happiness or whatever from pleasant emotion, you can work on your perception of the situations you have. that you have different entities, <coughs> you have cues, you have the triggers, so that's the first part. And what it is about to know exactly the emotion you have to face. Sometimes it's not just one, but several. And you have exactly to know, because otherwise you put strategies on and they are not on the right emotion, so you will not attend your goal. So if you go to this strategy part, the first part is to try to know which is the intensity of your emotion. Because if the emotion is really intense, it, you can't really manage it. It's like out of control. So the first thing is to know which is the intensity. I, I like the metaphor from a highway. It's the emotional highway. You know, uh, if you're on a highway, and I really will feel on the highways here, but if you're on a highway and you like, you are like 100 kilometers, okay? And you want to get off the highway. If you try to get off at this uh, 100 km speed, it can be quite difficult. With emotion it's the same. If you're on the highway of anger and you're like on seven point scale, you are on seven. It will be quite difficult to get out, to connect to interest, to understand what the other person is feeling. Okay? So it's a really fundamental question to say, my emotion, which is the intensity of my emotion? Because if it's too high, 
you will have like more negative consequences, outcomes when it's low intensity. But also if it's too low, it also is complicated. I had to see you and we worked together on anger. Because he did not understand why people, when he says stop and he, he wants to defend the value, people don't respect it. Okay? And so we worked together and I said, okay, show me how you express anger. And he was in front of me, okay, so there we express my anger, and he started to smile. I said, oh, that's quite complicated. How do you want that other people understand that perhaps you, are, you don't agree with what they say, but you smile? Because when you smile, you, you, you show them like more like joy, you know. But if you are not, not alive with what the other person say, then you have to show a little bit of anger, like two or three, you know. But you have to show it. So it's complicated if you don't show the right intensity, because you will not obtain the right outcome. And that it is about. Emotions have outcomes. It's since the beginning I tell you that there are emotions that have positive intentions. If I'm angry, it helps me to affirm myself, to say, okay, here's a boundary, and I don't want you to go through this boundary. You stay on the other side. Okay, it's an emotion that helps me here. But if it is expressed too high, there is a risk. The risk is I say things, I regret, or I get aggressive. So every emotion has risk, every emotion has positive intention. So the so aim is to connect to the positive intention of the emotion you have to deal with. When do you have to think about this? That you have to change your emotional state? Because you don't have to change it all the time. Sometimes you just can enjoy your emotion. But we have sometimes to change it. It's when you are not aligned with these outcomes, when there are risky outcomes. That's really the first point. After also, it's when emotion gets dysfunctional. We took the time to talk about emotion health triggers. So when the emotion loses the trigger, it gets dysfunctional. I give you the example for fear. If you have fear, you have somewhere danger. But if you lose this trigger, your fear will get anxiety. It evolves to anxiety. And then you have fear to have fear, literally. Okay? So there's a problem. Emotions get problematic when you lose the trigger. And also when emotions start to leave. You know? I don't know if it happens already to you that you have like a fear in the morning. And the fear is in the middle of the day still there. And in the evening, you are still thinking about this uncertainty and you feel still the fear. And here it starts to take duration, it's getting in time. And that's, we talk about emotions dysfunctional. It's perhaps not as problematic for pleasant emotion than for unpleasant emotion. But you have to know how to stop an emotion when it starts to get in duration in time. An emotion is like seconds. It's one, two, three minutes, but it's not an hour, it's not a day. Another criteria is when emotions disagree with your goals. We already talked about it. And the last is when emotions block your achievement. So that's also my point where it's really important to manage your emotion. So the question now is, how do you do? The first thing, you have to decide what you have to modify. You know, you make a diagnosis, I don't know, you have a situation where you have to do a speech. Okay? In the speech, you are afraid, you feel fear. So the first thing you have to, to analyze is, my fear, what is the intensity? Okay, it's six on a seven point scale. So the risk is that I get paralyzed or that I will not be understanding. So here I can say, I have to decrease my fear in intensity. Because fear will help me to concentrate, but it has to be a little fear, moderated. If it's too high, I will be paralyzed. So that is one element where you can change your emotion. It's about intensity. There are situations you will 
enhance the intensity and others you may decrease it. For example, if you have a teacher who tells you a bad joke, you know, and it's not really funny, so you, you will increase your joy. But in other situations, you will also decrease joy. If you have to take a test and you're really, really happy, you will be trying to concentrate. So there's a situation you have, you have to calm down joy and happiness to be able to concentrate. So that's the first part. If you want to modify your emotion, you need to modify your emotion, you can put it a little bit on or a little bit more off. Okay? Other element is sometimes we can shorten an emotion or we can, on the other one, we can uh, stretch it. Yeah? If you have to run a brainstorm session, one hour, two hours, what is the emotion? Enhancing creativity, it's moderate anxiety. So for one hour you can stretch this emotion to help your team to perform. So that is about, sometimes we can stretch emotion or we have to know to cut them down. You know, if you do an intervention, me, I do a lot of conference, and sometimes I have uh, uh, an information, I remember it was once, my, 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 uh, my girl, she, she broke his leg. And it was like 20 minutes before having my conference. And I had my telephone and the information, okay, we are at the hospital, your, your child is, uh, has broken the leg. And so I had just to know how to shorten my emotion. It was like about frightening and a lot of guilt. Because with this emotion, it would not be easy to create a, a link to other people in my, in my room and to be really concentrated. So I had to shorten them and to connect to other emotions. And that is what we call activate resource emotion. For me in this moment, my resource, my resource emotion was like interest. How can I be curious to other people? They are here to listen to what I say. And how can I, 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 I transfer a little bit of my passion to them about emotion? So that was my, my resource emotion. So that's the third way how you can modify your emotional state. We call it it's fixing a target emotional state. You have your emotional state, but the given situation requires a modification and you will have a target emotional state. Now it's the easiest part, because if you know your target state, you just have to develop a regulation strategy to so, what is regulation about? It's about modifying your emotional state. We have at least uh, four families of strategies who help us to modify our emotional state. We have families that are centered on the modification of your trigger. If, for example, you fear a situation and you say, okay, there is danger. So look at the situation, look uh, perhaps uh, if it is um, like a conference or you have to take an exam, uh, then how you can modify the situation is to look uh, precedent examens from, from the years before you. Or if you have a, 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 a recruitment test, then you can prepare with a friend. So you modify by trying to develop resources to manage with the situation. So that's all about situation. But there's another part also, you can select situations. Because sometimes it is okay to avoid some situations. That is what you see on the first two, it's about situation. Then we have attentional deployment. What is an emotion strategy really efficient with children is emotional attention deployment. You know, uh, you have a child that, that is crying about something and you just show him another thing. And so the attention switch. And with others it's quite the same. You know, uh, we have uh, a lot of, um, I work with students and, and one of her favorite, the, the favorite strategy is, okay, I get distraction. Uh, at the midday, I will talk to a colleague, or we go out in the evening. All these are distraction uh, strategies. On the other way, you can distract, but you can also focus. You know, uh, if sometimes you are bothered by an emotion, you can focus and read a book about something, and you focus in something that interests you. Here, you have another modification of your 
your attention and focus. Okay? So that is about emotional focus. And what you have to know is our natural way is to focus on what is danger. Why? Because when we when we were prehistoric humans, you know, seven years ago, it was more important to see that perhaps we don't have enough wood to make fire than to look at all the nice stars and the Survival. But today, perhaps in our society, it changed a little bit. So we can choose where we put our attention. After you have cognitive reappraisal, it's when you change your way to interpret the situation. Okay, it's really, uh, perhaps first you say, I don't have any resource to manage with it. And wow, this situation is really, really, really important for me. And after you make reappraisal, perhaps you say, it's important, but it's not a question of life. It's important, but it's not my life who's here in play. Uh, perhaps, yeah, real price is, I hope I have not a lot of resources, but I have some resources, and I can try to trigger them. So, that all we call cognitive real price. It's also sometimes question your values, your, your beliefs about how things have to work. And then we have the last, uh, last uh, family, it's response modulation. What is this about? It's you saw all the cues that help us to identify emotions. So I can modify each one of them. For example, if I might I am sad, normally my expression would be like more uh, my my uh, my shoulders down, I'm a little bit of uh, uh, my my, uh, my face shows uh, no smile. And if in this moment you take the posture of pride, you will change and modify your emotional state. Because if I take the posture of an emotion, I express an emotion, it will help to rise this emotion in me. That is an example for this kind of strategy. Also, we have all strategies for breathing. You know, for example, you have a high activation for emotion and you breathe to calm it down. That is also an example here of the response modulation strategy. So what is interesting here is if you look at the timeline, okay? All these first strategies on the situation, on the attentional deployment, on the cognitive free advisor, it's before the emotion really rises. So you're really managing your emotion early in the emotion rising process, okay? So that's interesting to develop this because uh, it prevents really intense emotion because you capture them early. And after we have this strategy, it's focused on response modification. What is the aim? If we uh, work with people, the first thing is to know what they are doing. Uh, I know for my students, they are a lot, uh, their preferred strategy is on attention deployment. But I work also with firefighters. You know firefighters? Firefighters, they often anticipate the situation, they, they anticipate everything. And then, when they are in the situation, they modulate their response, they breathe, to calm down when the fear comes. But in the middle of it, when they are in an intervention, they don't work with the strategies. So one thing we try to work with them is to develop this other part. You know? Often what they find their uh, managers and CEOs it's cognitive reappraisal. They are always saying, okay, I will check a new time the situation and uh, what are my resources, what I can do. They are often monopolized on this strategy. But what is the problem when you are just mono strategy is that when the situation has a new element, when there is an emotion, new emotion in the, in, in, in the situation, people have not the strategy to manage it. So the aim is to get flexibility and to know how to use all these kinds of strategy. <coughs> if you look on my slide, you see there is one family missing. Yes, what is this family about? It's about social support. Social support is really a really efficient strategy. Why? Because social support can help you 
to work on the situation, it helps you to reorientate your attentional focus, it helps you to reinterpret the situation and also can help you to modify your emotional response. So it's a really important strategy. But you have to know to who talk about which kind of emotion. You know, for example, when I, 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 I told my family to, that I will come to India, there was some part of my family, I only told them when I bought the tickets. <laughs> because I know that uh, they will really doubt about everything, you know, long travel, unknown country. And I don't talk to these people because I was all, all, also a little bit afraid, you know. And so I talked to people who said to me, yeah, it's really good that you're doing that. Yeah, you will manage it. Because I already doubted. So I will not talk to a person who will make me doubt a lot more, you know. And that's important when you, have, when you talk about social support as a really efficient strategy. You have to know to who to talk with what kind of emotion. On the other way around, sometimes I'm really sure for what I'm doing, you know. And in this moment, I know I will talk to some of my family members because they will make me really doubt about everything. <laughs> so I made a final checkup before really deciding what to do. So that is about social support. But you have to try to define to who to talk before you are in the emotion. If you have to define before, because when you're in the emotion, you need the social support. So you have to thought about it before. So really strategically develop your support, your social support system. So that was uh, the emotional intelligence uh, model. We visited the seven steps. And now I will share with you just some, uh, some tools to develop emotional intelligence. So the first tool is really about train yourself on the seven abilities train you to identify emotion in your body. Try to learn about these emotional cues. And, and that all the emotions have minimum five emotional cues. So which are they? Try to identify the triggers, your triggers, triggers of other persons, to make really precise diagnosis. And then train the strategic part. Look for new goals in emotion management. Try new strategies. So that is really important and you have to experience it because uh, you can read, you have a lecture, but it's not by reading and having a lecture you develop your emotional competencies. You have to try in real world. You know, you have uh, exposed you to situations where you are frightened and try to new strategy in the situation. You have to expose you and to train you in real life. Another tool is emotional weather report. People with who uh, I coach or train, I say to them, they have to do at least three times a day an emotional weather report. What is it about? It's, I do an emotional checkup. Okay, now I am feeling what? And which intensity? And I do it also with other people. I, I, not, for me, it's really a reflex, you know. When I meet someone, I first look what he is feeling. Because if he is feeling angry, I wish to take his anger. And it's not my anger. And I was not even the trigger. As a person, if he is angry, and I, will, I want to talk with this person about the project and how to develop something or be critical on something, he will have like, like, um, like a feature on his eye with anger. So it will be quite difficult to, to talk with the person. So do an emotional weather report because it's a condition to change your weather, your emotions, or the emotional state of another person. Also key is how to use positive emotion, pleasant emotion. We talked about well-being. It's about one pleasant, one unpleasant emotion. You need three pleasant emotions to compensate it, and whether it is even five. So if you have one anger, you need to convert perhaps a bit of joy, proud, uh, interest, satisf satisfaction, and, and we need one more, you know, to be one to five. So that is really important. Use 
positive parent emotion. Also, search for complementary emotions. And that's a quiet uh, personal thing because some emotions will, will, will work with me, but not with another person. I had an exchange uh, with, with a, a friend and we worked on, okay, you have to do presentation and you have fear. What will be a resource emotion? And I said, why not try? But the person said, no, try not. Too much risk because if I'm proud, yeah, I, I will get my concentration down. So, okay, what would it be for you? But for me, it's more like about interest, curiosity, that make me explore things. And that is my resource emotion. Okay. So, find your resource emotion. That's really important and know how you convoke them. And even stressful situations. For me, pride is a resource emotion and also curiosity. But I know sometimes perhaps this are not yours. After, it, it's all about develop also new strategies to handle your emotions. For me, for example, uh, all these techniques for respiration have a, 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 an image to think about. It really took the time. For me first, uh, to think about something calming or so, it was not working. More it was like, okay, I have to do it, but jogging, you know, running. And then the emotion came down. Yeah, but I tried several times, and then the strategy started to work. So you have to try to experience new strategies, and give you the chance to really know if they work. It's not because the first time it don't work, that the strategy don't work. Try it some longer. And after, it's perhaps the last point, but also the most important perhaps, it's about expressing your emotion. It's really important to express, express your emotion. We have a problem with, uh, when you don't express the unpleasant emotion, if I don't express my anger I feel in a relationship, what will be the problem? The problem will be that the person I'm working with he thinks that everything is fine. And I feel angry because perhaps yeah, he, he crossed my boundaries. But let us don't say anything, but he continue. You know, and so we don't we can't grow together in a satisfying relationship. So we really have to express our unpleasant emotions. Because it's like um, if you don't tell them, it gets like bigger and bigger and it takes more and more pain. And after perhaps you, you can't stay in this relationship. Even if it's with a co-worker or, or, or in a work context, you know. So it's really important. But it's also really important to express pleasant emotions. Because when I take someone, I feel joy when we work together. What does he understand? He understands that we are doing well. We have to continue working like that because that's a good way. If I don't say, yeah, I'm proud, we work together and we have a super result. Yeah, if we don't share this, we, we, we can't grow and continue this way of working. So expression of emotion is really important. But we need to express the emotion at the right intensity. If it's too intense, the other person will not share the message. He can't handle it. So it's about really how to express that's another chapter, but the importance is already expressed. So that it was what I want to share with you. It was a little bit of theory, what are studies telling us about emotional intelligence in workplace, leadership, defining emotion, defining emotional intelligence, and to finish with some tools how to develop emotional intelligence in you or perhaps a you. So if now you want, you can share some questions.
psychologic or um, neurologic person. What we see is um, emotional intelligence is really linked negatively to this concept. We, we just finished a study about Machiavellism and emotional intelligence. And what we see clearly is uh, the more emotional intelligence uh, you are, the less you are, the probability to be a Machiavellian person is really, really low. So that's really good finding. Okay? But what we see also is that the, the, the functioning in organization change. What uh, is the history? First, it was about, okay, we are optimizing process to get more performance. And then we try to optimize humans, okay? And uh, here there were sometimes very, really hard behaviors, not really uh, co cohesive or well-being, empathy. It was not really valued. But it's like, uh, I can't talk for India, but what I see in, in France and even in, in international com co uh, companies, it's now it gets value because they see that you have an advantage in performance. We don't develop emotional intelligence in organizations to have uh, smiling people, you know. Uh, it's not the, the aim, it's not about this. It's about really creating a new, uh, new way to create more performance. Okay. And if you have well being with it, okay. You know, but the first aim of organization will be around that. And we really have changed you know, emotional intelligence, it's uh, uh, 1990, so it's 30 years. It's really young. Yeah. And uh, we have first on about stress. We have from uh, you know, 1935, <coughs> the 60s, we had a lot of stress research. You know, you dare to fight, you fly. You know, it was really reduced on this. Yeah. And now we start to talk about emotion and all of this very tier of emotion and to link them to performance and even well-being. So I think it is changing because what we observe is the new generations, they have high emotional intelligence. And so when society will evolve, we hope that we have more human needs, a humanized organization.
don't have the word for anger and, and you use the word like more for fear. The other person is completely lost because you think, okay, it's about fear, but you, you're talking about. So we really have to, to need and develop a language. And we have not just the intercultural problem, that's a, a supplementary problem. I would say, I'm German living in France, now talking in English. I don't know for you, but yeah, we have, uh, and we can send back this five language affect. Um, but there's also, for a person speaking the same language, it's quite difficult because often they don't have the emotional language. I uh, work in French or in English or in German, and sometimes the people don't have the word in their language, you know. And we already do a lot of education here because having the right word uh, tells about intensity, tells about your trigger, and, and that's really important. So, yeah. We have to develop it, and, and uh, I, I like to say we have to have a lot of empathy. So if the other person don't really understand what we say, stay calm and continue to explain. And, and so we will try to understand each other. And it's, it's really important to have a lot of empathy and oh to self empathy also, because sometimes we don't find the right words and we have to find them. And uh, yeah, I, I search a lot in, in books or in the internet to find words for emotion, and it's really not easy. I don't know if not uh, perhaps the best answer because it's a non-answer, but it's uh, really complex to have this uh, the words and uh, and we have to develop it. Yeah. Mm. There's another question. I know it's like seven thirty, and you have still a lot of attention. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Do you have a word for Anish? Well, I'll try. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope uh, you have enjoyed this uh, learning, and hopefully, we all are motivated to develop some aspects or at least to reflect uh, on certain aspects of uh, our own emotional experiences, our emotional regulations, and also our interactions. It definitely was a learning for me. Thank you very much, Dr. Mikhazel. Allow me for a Jindo special tradition where we are offering you a